I need to press continue with Edward, yeah. You do. Yeah. Yeah, done. And you agree that you're being recorded, so I can't sneakily tell everyone all your secrets. Not a problem. <laughs> so, good afternoon. Today I have Gary with me. Hi, Gary. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? All right, okay. Well, my name is um, Gary Dobbs. Um, um, in terms of my writing, I started off writing westerns um, for a British publisher, uh, Robert A. Limited. Um, and these westerns were largely aimed at the library trade. Um, I did 10 odd covers for those. Um, and unfortunately, the company went um, out of business a couple of years ago. But the books are still in the library, and every now and then they bring me in some um, lending right money. So that's a nice thing. I've also written um, non fiction, and I still write non fiction mostly on subjects, um, history. I've done um, couple of books on the First and Second World War. And I've also done a couple of uh, true crime books. Um, but at the moment, I'm concentrating more on, on the fiction side of crime. Um, I recently um, re-released a book, which is uh, a book of mine you recently read, Down Among the Dead. And I'm currently working on a, a follow-up to that, which is provisionally titled. I think I'm going to stick with the title because I don't know what it means, but I like the title. Um, and it's provisionally titled Listen to the Wind. So I'll try and work that in somehow so it makes sense because I do like that title. <laughs> so. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? Um, yeah, it's something I've done since I was um, a kid, really. Um, I can remember writing what I thought was my first book, and I wish I still had it. It, it was it was just um, something I scribbled down in the school exercise book um, years ago, and we're going back, because I'm, I'm fairly aged now, but we're going back to the mid-70s, and there was a television program on, um, which I loved as a kid, called The Six Million Dollar Man. Um, it was the Bionic Man thing, and um, I kind of ripped that off and wrote my own version of it, so I, I wish I could, I wish I kept this, probably, thrown out because my mother threw it out because I wouldn't do my own work or something but um yeah so I've always written in some way or other and what gave you the push to go for it properly um well as I say I've always written I I wrote um over the years I've had quite a few um short stories or articles published in magazines um in this one magazine I was published in you're talking 20 years ago uh fear magazine skeleton crew sort of short stories um, and it was a chance meeting with a friend of mine who was writing Western novels um, because being British and I never thought there was a market for Western novels and he knew that I grew up with, with the Western genre. My grandfather loved watching old Western movies and he's kind of rubbed off on me. So he said to me, why don't you try a Western? You know, and he went from there. And as soon as I um, got, I suppose, professionally published, I kind of started look. It gave me a, a bit of... Um, confidence I think because I was actually being paid for this so I thought well it's not just something you know what I'm doing for my own enjoyment which is great but getting paid just sort of give me more confidence to branch out so you know, basically it came from that. What made you switch to crime? I've always liked um, crime novels um, I, I, I don't really get tied up in, in, in genre knots because well, if you take, let's go back to the Western for a minute. The Western can be anything. You know, the setting may, might have to be in, in America during what the period we call the Old West, but you get crime stories there. You you can get horror stories there, you know. And I've always been interested in crime. As a kid, I read a lot of Agatha Christie. Um, and over recent years, I've, I'm always reading, I like Mark Billingham, Ian Rankin, um, Michael Connolly is just so much. I tend to, I think, read and watch TV in, in the crime genre. So it's kind of an extension from the Westerns, really. It's, you know, it's all action and character, really. So, yeah. But yours are slightly different because they're set just after the start of World War II. Yeah, um, that's the, the Frank Parade book. Um, I always lean more towards historical rather than current day because with current day you've got all this you've got dna you've got um, electronic surveillance everywhere 
And that's fine. I, I never I read some great books, you know, which, which is centered on DNA or, or, or surveillance and so forth. But it's not me. I prefer, I, I just got my image of, of the detective, whatever character I'm writing about, sort of having to, to do the, the trudging about, you know, it, it, it's all on his. I, I just prefer um, historical rather than contemporary. You know, it's um, on the war. It's a subject that I'm very interested in. Um, I've studied the Second World War. I've written several books on it. But it, what really gets me about that period is not so much the the order of the war itself and what was going on in the back, but what was going on on the home fronts in, in the different countries. You know, people were so resilient, and it, it was an amazing time for all the 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 horror and. It's just people sort of really pull it together, and not, and not just in this country. I mean, you know, we, we, when we tend to look at the, at the war, we think um, the main enemy at that time were the German people. And yet ordinary um, German people were going through the exactly the same experiences that the British were, or the Americans, or Japanese, anyone else, you know. It's, it's, it's just an interesting backdrop to the to the detective story to have the war going on. So. Yeah, that's what I said they're doing in the early years of the Second World War. Yeah, I mean, I read a lot of crime and there was something about it that made me want to get back to it if I had to put it down. And I think that was part of the reason because it was different, but also because it wasn't science, it was people. And uh, yeah, it was, I mean, I loved it as you could probably tell from my review. <laughs> and uh yeah, the, the war gave an interest in, it wasn't like the main thing, but it was there. So yeah, I like, I like that. Small little aspects that I, I try and bring in into the book, and, and I, which I'll bring into the books going forward. Um, because as you say, the war is going on in the background, but it, it affects everyone daily life in so many different ways. Some of the, the things I found out, you know, it was the, 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 just driving a car in the street, you had to have, um, uh, covers all your headlights, you know, and it, it, it's something that might not actually be important to the actual the book, but it, it adds colour, it, it brings the, the world to life, the period, so. Yeah, um, yeah, I didn't know that till I read your book, so that was, uh, yeah, I had no idea, but I suppose it makes sense when you think about it, but wow. Mm -hmm. Smoking a cigarette outside could could get someone in trouble, you know, because um, the minuscule light of a cigarette, I don't know if it could or not, but the authorities claimed it could be seen by a, a, an enemy plane. So life was so different. It was kind of, and in some ways, even though you're writing is is fairly recent history, but because of the the differences in 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 the everyday way of life, it's almost an alien world you're writing about. And it just makes it more interesting for me. Yeah, well, it made it a great read as well, so it works. Oh, great. <laughs> um, out of all the books you've written, including your westerns, do you have a favourite character? Um, I'll have to say Frank Parade because um, it's the character I'm working. I mean, I've written the one book down among the dead, and I'm working on the second now. But I, so I'm still building the character. And I, he, I kind of tried to make, give him a, a very dark sense of humour, very black sense of humour, because he's, he's got a lot of compassion. But I think because of the, the, the things he has to deal with day in, day out, um, that, that dark sense of humour will, will help him, you know? And, and he also sometimes questions himself because, um, for instance, um, the, the book Listen to the Wind will feature a lot of air raids. Um, so a lot of people are killed in areas and yet he's got to investigate a single murder. And, you know, he's trying to find out why this person was killed when there's death happening all around him. And he starts questioning, does it really matter? And, and obviously it, it does because it, it, war is war, murder is murder. But I, th I think that I try to, I try to make him as, as, as real as I can. So he questions everything. And I think all the best best crime fiction does do that. If you go to um, what's been very popular in recent years, the Nordic um, novels, they tend, 
where we had um, the, the Agatha Christie sort of school, if you like, where the murder was a great puzzle. Um, and the characters were secondary to it. I mean, Agatha Christie was a wonderful writer, um, absolutely superb, but her characters, they, they just, they were sort of ciphers. But I think the Nordic sort of thing has brought character more, and that's what I'm more interested in, character mm -hmm. rather than, you know, the puzzles. So. Yeah, he's a great character. And as I said in my review, there's that one one little thing that he does that tells you everything about what he is and who he is, which, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people, but, well, I mean, it's in my review, but, yeah, yeah he yeah, was yeah. Uh, he was fun. And, and it was great. <laughs> um, what's the most interesting thing you found researching your books? Um most interesting thing uh it, it's difficult to single any one thing out but i think in terms of my crime novels and the setting of, of the, what really interests me is the police force was so defeated um they tended to be a lot of the older officers who weren't the sick who, who stayed or weren't swallowed up by the armed forces so it kind of um uh, almost a geriatric police force at the time you know but um so it makes Frank Perez seem young and he's middle-aged himself. So it just, I, I, I couldn't single out to one single thing, really. But um, as I say, it's, um, I think it's easier for me to get away with the odd mistake because if I do make a mistake about something, um, chances are people won't realise because it was so long ago rather than if I made a mistake on police procedure in the current day. You know, you'd get someone saying, no, that's, that's not how it happened. So I think it gives me a little bit of scope. Hello, the research has got to be pretty much smart on. I think I've got a little bit of wiggle room. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and what was your most fun scene to write and what was the most difficult? Um, I like the scenes in 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 Down Among the Dead where Parade was interacting with the German characters. Um, not to go into too much of the plot, but um, it, it's nothing to do with the central plot of the story. But there's a scene where a, a German plane is shot down during an air raid, and there's several German Germans um, on the loose. Um, and when I was writing that, I I felt it was very important for Parade to interact with them. With, with the one German in particular as an equal, which is why I made the German a policeman. Be he, he talks about his street with Parade and he says that he was like him, he was a policeman before the war. So Parade looks upon him, yeah, he's an enemy, but he's an enemy by circumstances rather than anything else. So I, I, I enjoyed that. I liked, um, because these men were basically enemies, uh, the British and the German guys, so I had to keep it on that footing, but I also wanted to allow them to interact as well. And, and Parade considered him not a criminal, but a prisoner of war. So, you know, and the, the roles could have been easily reversed if Parade had been in Germany. So yeah, I think that was um, that was an important scene. But the the, the follow-up book I'm working on, um, Listen to the Wind, the central, that's got several plot elements to it, but there's a, a series of murders in it which are very much based on um, a real murder that happened here in South Wales um, in 1912, which I researched for one of my non-fiction books. Um, and I'm having a little bit of a problem um, with that aspect of the story, because I know what really happened. And it was in a, I did the background to it, um, so you can understand where I'm coming from, but it's basically a 15-year-old boy um, killed an eight-year-old girl in the early part of the century and um, he was arrested by the police but the people of, of the village wouldn't believe that one of their own could do such an horrendous thing and they considered it was a, a transient person and anyway he was taken to uh, court he was put in prison he was tried for murder and he was found not guilty simply because of the fact that they couldn't believe that a, a young boy could, this is you know the early part of the century but nowadays you, you hear about things like that but when he was released from prison, um, the, the village was trimmed up um, with bunk bins as if he was a warrior or returning home because 
the aspect that normal people looked at, it, it was as a man then. It was a working class environment. The police weren't really popular. So anyway, the village was trimmed up, but to cut a long story short, a week later, he killed another girl, and he was captured red under this time. So I've used that for the basic plot of the story. And that's kind of difficult to write because, because it's really based on real events. I need to be respectful to what happened. Oh, yeah, it was all 100 years ago, but it was still real people that, you know, it, it, you're concerned with. So, yeah. Um, have you made lots of author friends since you started writing? Yeah, um, I've got quite uh, a few um, friends who write Mark Dillingham. I, I regularly in correspondence with him. Um, but there's a lot of writers who, who are sort of largely unknown, like myself, I know. And a um, great thing was there were a series of books out when I was a kid, Westerns, brutal, um, sort of violent Westerns written by a chap who went by the name of George D. Gilman. Um, and I loved those when I was a kid. We'd, we'd get them from a local bookshop, you know, and all my friends in school would read them because they were so violent. They were totally unsuitable for children, but we loved them. And when I started, when I became published myself, and I, I found out who George Gilman was. He was a gentleman called Terry Arknett. He passed away um, just over a year ago. And I've been very friendly with him. And I I brought his books back into print via e-books, which, you know, it just gave me a kick to do that because I was such a fan as a friend, uh, as, a, as a child. So, yeah. But um, I've got a circle of writers that I, you know, sort of keep in touch with and we talk back and forth and swap ideas or whatever. So it's support really. So, yeah. I've um I've interviewed Mark Billingham and I've seen him a couple of times he's a nutcase, but a nice one. <laughs> well he did he's done it all, hasn't he? Acting, stand up comedy. And um yeah. And, and of course he, he's a um uh probably <laughs> he wants to be a rock star with his and loving criminals so yeah he's a, he's a lovely chap and he's very yeah, he generous with his time as well because when i i written to him you know and um in the past and he always answers he always writes back you know so yeah it's very nice guy yeah it doesn't surprise me um and do you get much feedback from readers um not as much as i'd like um but yeah, I do get some, um, you know, when people read your books, I think reviews are very important, especially with the publishing industry, the way it's working now. Um, because when I started many years ago, there was no such thing as ebooks or, or self-publishing, independent publishing, as they call it now. And, and it was known then as vanity publishing. It was kind of a dirty word. But things have changed a lot now. And, you know, over recent years, you've had books which have been considered vanity publishing taken on the publishing industry um a totally different genre to what i used to but 50 shades of gray was a perfect example you know it, it was in in terms of of sales it was a world beater you know and there's other writers that have done that as well so i think things are changing and yeah it's um i like more feedback from readers but so I, I just take what i can get really and, it, and it's lovely when someone like yourself says oh i enjoyed this i couldn't put it down you know because that's the only reason we write really yeah. What's been your highlight so far since you started writing? Um, getting my first copy of my first book, which was the Western Tarnished Star. Um, and I was published not under my own name. I used the name Jack Martin, which was my grandfather's name. Um, it was great to get our first book and to actually hold it in my hand. But every um, time a book comes out has been an highlight but um a few years back now before the covid crisis i did a couple of um talks in local hospitals to elderly people about my western novels because it, it's kind of um it seems to be elderly men read westerns but it was great you know <laughs> sort of just talking away um about my books and on about the period because i i'm quite knowledgeable on that period um just because it's always interested me so yeah that was an highlight Definitely. It made me feel like I was um, some superstar right there, you know. So it was great. <laughs> um, when you're editing your books, what's your most overused word or phrase? Uh, don't know, but I, 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 I tend to alter speech a lot in the editing process because 
when I'm on a, a, a flow in writing, I tend to um, write too slangy. Um, you know, the way we, we speak, and I, I think, you know, this is 1940 now, we wouldn't use these slang phrases. So I tend to take a lot of slang out, but, but I do try and keep my dialogue not too regimented. I, I, I like it to be sort of as if you, you're someone in the street saying it. But yeah, I think slang mostly I've got to take out of that. Uh, out of books and being Welsh, I tend to drop drop my H's in speech. So um gives me a problem sometimes whether I should use the word A or am, you know, so I've got to really think about it. Stuff like that. I'm from Bedfordshire, we drop our T's. Right, okay. Which is yeah, I realise I'm doing it and I've realised I sound really common, but I can't help it, yeah. especially if I get excited. <laughs> It's only, it's only when you become conscious where you realise in, in normal speech you don't realise you're doing it, but yeah. But, it, but it's great. It's fast more colour, isn't it? You know, we've all got our own little quirks from the area we're from, our own different speech patterns. And it's great. Yeah, I didn't think I had an accent because, I mean, I don't really think I do, but I went up north and someone's like, yeah, you do have an accent. I was like, oh, okay then. The accent doesn't sound too um, um, pronounced to me, but then I don't. My accent probably sounds really deep Welsh to you because I've got what's called a Valley's accent, and and I can I can exaggerate and I can sort of talk like this, which makes it even more Welsh. But um, but I think accents, you know, they 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 great because they, as I say, it just adds color to characters. But try writing in an accent. That's a difficult thing. <laughs> Do you know, um, are you in contact with a lot of other Welsh writers or are you just all over? Yeah, and then there's quite a few of you. Yeah, all over really. Um, I tend to um, talk to writers who are working in the same genre as me as, as I am, um, you know, because we just bumping to each other online, talking with something so we become friendly. So, but no, it's nowhere, not sort of localised to Wales, it's all over really. Because I heard that the Welsh writers were going to try and oust the Scottish and the North East as the next big thing. <laughs> that would be good. Welsh noir. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, why not? All the Welsh oh. writers I know are amazing. So you just need to get together and you could do it. I have faith. Well, it's not before time because, as we say, we've had the, the big Scottish movement, and and all, all, always the English have been at the forefront. So yes, time for the Welsh Tafi Noir, we could call it. <laughs> I say, I'll, I want to take credit when that happens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely, um, copyright the phrase. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, if you're able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Um. Well, do you know, I'd have to say someone like Ian Fleming, not because, because I'm, because of, of what he wrote really, um, I, although I did used to read the James Bond novel, but Fleming, I'd, I'd hear it described as the Fleming sweep, and he could sometimes describe in great detail a food, because he had, there was a lot of snobbery in his books. Um, because the bond was written as this sort of upper class kind of not really very like a roman, but there was a lot of snobbery clothes with the clothes were described. Um the, the, the jewelry was wearing, it was there a lot of but Fleming did in such a way that he just flew by. Um on a yeah, view they described as a Fleming sweep. He's a, he's a fantastic writer. Um if, if someone's only familiar with the, the, the James Bond movies, to go back and read the original Fleming novels would be a massive eye opener. I think in terms of, of keeping the reader glued to the pages, very few people as good as Fleming. So yeah, and, and also I think he was a big part of my childhood. I loved those books when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, do you have any phobias and would you write about them? Um, I don't really have any phobias. Um, so I think I'd write about anything. I think. The, the dark aspects of of people's characters interest me. Um, and I hope that you know if I'm writing of of a dark character, 
maybe dark because because of the actions he's done that I that I could do it in a realistic way because I think that I don't believe that something like um, evil as such would exist in any character. I think they got to be pushed into them circumstances and perhaps they would become evil. But I, I'd like to really sort of bring that out in a realistic way then, you know, rather than A is a killer, B is a so-and-so. So I, I think the psychological aspects, I think that's what I'm trying to say. That's, that'd be important to me. So I don't think I'd be afraid of writing anything because of a phobia as such. I don't like English people doing it in the rugby when they beat us, but that's that's probably my only phobia. Otherwise, I love English people. It's only doing it in the rugby. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's not my thing. I prefer football. Yeah. Deborah understood rugby. No, it's a big it's a big thing about in Wales and um every time England and Wales are playing, that's the big match. You know, and um they they great, it's just banter, but um yeah. <laughs> yeah, my old um well one of our old PE teachers and my head of house at school was a a big Welshman and yeah, we knew all about <laughs> rugby and everything. He was lovely though. Mm. Um do you hide secret jokes or messages in your book? Um not so much secret, but I do put in jokes in that someone who knows me would, would know about or um, certain cultural in jokes um, because I'm very aware of what's happening in pop culture so I can't, I can't think of an example of one but I tend to do that a lot and sometimes I might steal a really well-known line from a film and pop that in the book knowing that some people are going to notice that and it's just a little bit of humor I suppose <laughs> oh, cool <laughs> yeah um, as you have such an interest in Westerns and in the world of wars, I'm interested to know if you're able to travel back in time where you would choose to go to, would it be one of them or would it be somewhere completely different? No, I think I would like to go back to um, the Western period or a Victorian era anyway. Um, so many things I'd like to great if you could just stand by and watch things happening, you know. But um, yeah, I think Victorian era, really, whether it's Britain or America. It's interesting. Yeah, popular choice. Yeah. <laughs> Not for me. I'd rather keep the modern uh, sanitary rules and medicine, etc. <laughs> I would have fancy going back. No, the trick would be to take those with you. That'd be the trick. Yeah, well, then you could be rich, but you'd change the future, and then that's just causing problems. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you like to do in your free time? Um, I, I walk my dog a lot. I'm very into um, the countryside, always have been. I mean, the area I was brought up is, is a rural area, so the countryside has always been important to me. Um, and I also like history. So I've recently I've been taking a lot of walks with my dog um, in local areas and sort of looking for signs of the, of the past because I've started to learn more about local history um, as I've got older. So yeah, I think history, um, walking, and I kind of combine the two. That's probably my main interest. And a bit of a wannabe um, David Attenborough, I suppose. <laughs> Um, do you collect anything? Books. I've got a massive collection of books. Um, every room in the house. Um, <laughs> I kind of collect pulpy paperbacks um, more than anything else. So, um, uh, books from the 40s, 50s. Um, I've got a massive collection. So yeah, I collect books on some old comics as well, the mostly books. Have you found since you became a writer that your signed book collection has grown quite a lot? Uh, signed book collection? Um, yeah, it, it has extended, but then it's difficult to tell if my books, are, uh, uh, my book collection is growing for any one reason because they keep piling up. I've always <laughs> books everywhere. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I have this issue as well. <laughs> you know, my wife's always complaining because I got too many books, but you can't have too many books. I mean, I've, I've got, I've, I've almost filled my Kindle up as well. So, you know. Wow, <laughs> that's some going. <laughs> Um, do you find much time to read? Um, what do you like to read when you do? I, I tend to make time to read. Um, I, I was reading something by Stephen King a few years back. I think it was a book called On Writing. Um, and any writer I'd recommend reading now. But he was he was basically um, talking about how to read a lot. And he, the advice he gave basically was if he was, say, standing by a bus stand for 10 minutes, he'd rip the book out. You know, and he might only read two or three lines, and I tend to always do that now. I've always got my Kindle with me, so I'm always reading stuff I like to read. Um, I like Joe Nesbo, um, Ian Rankin, as I mentioned, and going through the Rebus books now in order, which I've never done before. Um, I, I, I read a hell of a lot, and a lot of non-fiction. And at the moment, I'm reading a very interesting book by, it's on my shelf there, a guy called Donald Thomas. Um, and it's about the underworld during the Second World War. Um, that's very interesting. So, yeah, I'm always reading. <laughs> Are you looking to go to any of the literature events next year? Um, yeah, if we have any actual events next year, I'd like to go to, um, I'd like to go to Argate, um, the Crime Festival. Um, I, I am over recent years, but I've gone up to A on Y and Ross on Y a lot during the book festival. So, yeah, as soon as things are back to normal, I'd um, especially want to go to Argate. I've never, I see, I've probably dropped in the H and I sound close. Yeah, it's Argate. But um, <laughs> I'd like to attend that festival. So. That's one I'd highly recommend. I went for the first time this year and loved every second of it. And yeah, I got I, home on Sunday um, at about six o'clock. And by nine o'clock, I booked my hotel for next year because I knew that I wanted to go back. So, yeah. I go every every year over when the event is held. I'm reading about it online, you know, and what panels and what speakers have been at. Oh, I wish I was there. So, yeah, I'm going to make an effort to attend. Yeah, definitely do. And uh, poor Mark Billingham did it get left alone the whole weekend that I noticed. He always had someone talking to him. Right, okay. <laughs> but yeah it's great loved it and Harrogate's beautiful absolutely beautiful city so yeah, yeah. you go for a wander or there are hills everywhere my new says Wales isn't it there's lots of hills yeah Bedfordshire yeah. not so much it's quite flat <laughs> but that was a shock to the system <laughs> uh, and Russ you, you were um, main interest in reading tends to be um, the crime genre does this? I will read <clears throat> anything, but I do I do seem to veer back to crime. But I will. I mean, recently I think I've read a historical, um, dystopian, um, quite a few crime. Yeah, I will read literally anything. I'm not fussy. No, it's okay. But um, I tend to have a lot of people asking me to read their books. And I'm a lot of art teams. So generally I'm reading whatever someone asks me to read. Very rarely <laughs> do I look at my Kindle and go, oh, I want to read that. It's like, nope, you need to read this by this date. You need to read this one by this date. I'm like, okay, right, that one. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, you, you're becoming well known as a, as, a, as a reviewer and someone who does interviews. So that must be flattering to, to, to you. It is, yeah. It's, um, it is really nice actually, yeah, it's sweet, so. Yeah, good job I could read fast as well. <laughs> a book a day, sometimes I have to, because I have to review them, but yeah, it keeps me out of mischief and doing these as well. I am getting to talk to loads of lovely people. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so you said you're working on book two of your crime series, and then do you know what you're going to do after that? Um. I've got a commission to do another non-fiction book um, about the home front in the Second World War again, which I've got to uh, deliver by March next year. So I'm sort of sketching out the long side the, the, the book I'm working on. But I have um, got a rough plan for 10 of the Frank Perez books. I want to set write two books for every year of the war. So 
it will take me right to 1945. And I've got this sort of idea, although it's just is an idea at the moment, because I've, I've probably got the basic plots for the next two books. But then after that, I've just got general ideas of it. But I'd like the series to end as the war ends. So I don't know how I'm going to work that out. But um, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to do 10 books. Um, because there's so much to write about um, regarding the war. And as I say, it's the home front that matters to me in, in these books rather than the war itself. So, so many interesting things to explore. Music to my ears. I love it. I'd love to read 10 Frank Prey books. So, you know, no pressure now, but I want to read them. So you've got to write them. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll get them done. Um, the, 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 the biggest thing I'll say about the Frank Parade books, what took me the longest, was getting the name of Frank Parade. Um, I couldn't, I was trying to think of a, of a name that, that sort of really rang with me. And when I came up with Frank Parade, my original idea was, yeah, that'd be great for a series of novels because I could call them something like Parade's Walk, Parade's Way, Parade's This. But um, that didn't work out. But I, I do like the name Frank Parade. I just think it's, um, it's, it's got a ring to it. You know, so that was probably the other thing to get a name I was happy with because I was thinking of all the famous Inspector Morse, um, Rebus, you know, and Parade is the name that appealed to me in the end. Yeah, it's cool. It works and it's memorable. So, yeah. Well, you may be pleased to know that I don't have any more questions for you unless you think there's anything that I haven't asked you that you want to tell us. No, that's been um, great. I've enjoyed this. Well. It's, been, um, it's been fun. And uh, when you've written another few, then I'll have you back and grill you some more and get my little red envelope of tricky questions out and ask you some of the, the nastier questions. <laughs> Good stuff. So would you just like to tell everyone that where they can find out more about you if they'd like to and where they can get your books from? Right, um, a lot of my books, um, the Westerns are available online to purchase but you can pick them up from any library really um my non-fiction books again are available in bookshops um libraries um and there are digital versions online um down among the dead at the moment is available uh paperback uh digital and is a very good audio book version read by um, a gentleman called aubrey parsons and he's done a wonderful job um so basically just google my name and you'll find links to um you know, where, where the books are. Easy as that. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, same here, same here. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. So.